The reality is, before we even knew about those allegations, there had been a political abuse of power by the current leadership. That's why God in his word, Isaiah 10, now make sure you get this in the media, you quote this, Isaiah 10, chapter one, verse two. Woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children their prey. And pray there in Hebrew is considered to be a form of rape. Make sure that you say, the word said that. We better vote. And see, we keep talking about Trump, Trump, Trump. Trump couldn't do half of what he's doing without his enablers in the Congress. There are 4.7 million poor people in North Carolina. There are one million people in North Carolina without health insurance, and our legislature would not approve the Affordable Care Act, which would have covered 500,000 people without insurance. People like those down east that are being affected by the floods and the aftermath and the diseases. 346,000 of those people would have been white, 100 and some thousand would have been black, and 30,000 veterans. Most poor pe people are white women and children and disabled. And yet, when Republicans talk about the poverty, they blame the poor. And then when Democrats talk about the poor, they don't. They talk about middle class. And what we need is some leaders who will say there are 140 million poor people in this country and you cannot have a democracy when nearly 50% of your people are poor and low wealth. Something is wrong. Voter suppression is wrong, and voter apathy is wrong too. And we need to vote in a way that forces people to know we are here and there are issues that you have to deal with. Water. 
and the whoa, 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 it was cold. The angels in heaven done signed my name. It cheered my body, but not my soul. You know the angels in heaven done sign my name good lord I, I know I've been changed anybody know you've been changed oh three people and say, I know it, I know it. I know I've been changed. With all this stuff going on and I still got joy, I know. I know I've been changed. Hallelujah. Grab somebody by the hand while they play that softly. Lord, help us as changed people to be instruments of change and instruments of deliverance instruments of love and instruments of justice for you have changed us for change purposes thank you God now help us and hold us use us and guide us come Holy Spirit come with your changing and keeping power in Christ's name in the name of God we pray amen it is good to be here in the land of the living, um, it's good to be clothed in a portion of health and strength. I used to not talk like that when I was 30, <laughs> but now I know what the saints meant. I want to thank God for my one of my dearest friends in the whole world, the Reverend Dr. and Bishop Sir Walter Mack, who is who was a true error. Give God praise for the pastor who, um, who doesn't put on a lot of airs. You ask something of him and he's quick and will move on it when we wanted to have this nonpartisan gathering tonight. And to all of you here at Union and all of you in different places, to these young people, give it up for the young people. And to literally hundreds of thousands. Oh, this is being sent out to millions of people through four or five different platforms. So we could have as high as a million people tonight viewing this across the nation. So you all wave at everybody and tell them we're glad. Somebody say vote. vote. To a sister that I see almost like a daughter, Erin Bird, I told her some years ago, one of my goals was to help see her become one of the most powerful and strategic black women in North Carolina, in the South, and in the nation. She is a gift to us, Erin Bird, who's here tonight. We thank God for her. To Caitlin Swain, who is one bad lawyer, y'all. That's a bad, that's a bad white girl. She's like a daughter to me. I'm like an uncle to her children. And um, when we 
we were together one time and somebody put out on a note, they said, who is that with him? And they said, no, it's that his girlfriend? And somebody said, yeah, that's his girlfriend. They said, no, that's somebody the FBI put on him to watch it. And then somebody else came back. And then they said, no, well, just let's just get rid of both of them. And uh, I told Caitlin about it. I said, that's you no know, bad threat. She says, well, let's fight. And she's a fighter. To my dear friend, um, Roland Martin, who is gifting us so much. Um, and to... Uh, you know, you just have to listen to Woody sometimes, Woodson, Bishop Woodson. He's just gifted and unique in his own self. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I got it. And I want to ask you to stand for a second. I'm going to ask him when we finish tonight to give us the closing strategy. This is one of the most strategic brothers I know. We are blessed to have him at the helm, the presidency of the first brother out of the South, out of Mississippi, to lead the national NAAC. He flew all the way from California to get here tonight. Would you all stand and welcome President Derek Johnson, the president and CEO. That's the president and CEO of the national NAACP. And tonight he's going to come and talk about this strategy of what we can do in bringing people together. Help me just a little bit on the mic, if you would. We've been on doing these rallies uh, six in the last two, a day and a half, from, from the west all the way to the east. Uh, tomorrow we do another forum in Greensboro. We leave them for New York and Kentucky, and then doing rallies and gathering, get out to vote in Georgia and Florida, just left Mississippi, because these are serious times. And tonight, Bishop Mack, I just want to say that in the old testimony circles, how many of y'all remember testimony circles? When you didn't have all this music, you had your feet. And every now and then, a sister or brother would break out and sing, if we ever needed the Lord, we sure do need him now. And I want, however, tonight, in the tradition of hip hop, to sample and mix from that faith tradition and suggest if we ever needed to vote, we sure do need to vote now. And to build a movement both toward November and beyond. The right to vote is not just a constitutional matter. It is a theological matter, Al. Because we don't give the right to vote to parakeets, puppies, and pets. We only give the right to vote to people born 18 years or older, born or naturalized in these United States. That being the case, <clears throat> If we only give the right to vote, or people only want the right to vote who are people, human beings, then any time I attempt to suppress or subjugate or silence the vote of anybody, then I am suggesting that that person has not been made in the imago dei, the image of God. So that voter suppression is a form of idolatry. It is literally to use politics to suggest and the law to suggest that some people are subspecies. They are not really human beings. And therefore, the law and the politics has a right to sub suppress and to stifle their vote. We must know where we are today. Tonight. Can we go to school? We are tonight 399 years since the first ship landed in Virginia. Tonight. Tonight we're here 248 years since Crispus Attucks was the first American, not African American. He was African American, but he was the first American 
to die in the Revolutionary War. Here we are tonight, 231 years since the Constitution was adopted and 231 years since black people were fractionized, considered three-fifths of a person. The Electoral College was put in place to work with that racist fractionalization. Poor white men without land couldn't vote and women couldn't vote. Here we are 170 years since women had their first convention at Seneca Falls in 1848. I'm going somewhere. Here we are 155 years since the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation and 148 years since the ratification of the 15th Amendment which guarantees voting protections. Here we are. 130 years since riots in Wilmington, North Carolina were engaged to stop black and white fusion political power when black and whites were working together to change this state for the better. Here we are, 58 years since the sit-ins in Greensboro and 63 years since the brutal murder of Emmett Till and 64 years since Brown versus Board of Education and 54 years since Fannie Lou Hamer said sometimes you just got to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Here we are. 57 years rolling after Dr. King went to the AFL-CIO and said, look, the only voting bloc that can transform America will be for black people and labor and poor whites and Latinos to come together around a common agenda. That's right. That's right. Here we are, 98 years since women got the right to vote, 1920. 55 years since the murder of Mega. 55 years since the march on Washington. 55 years since the bombing, excuse me, 53 years, yeah, 55 years since the bombing of four girls in a Birmingham church and 20 other people were hurt. 54 years since the signing of the Civil Rights Act, 53 years since Bloody Sunday, 53 years since the Voting Rights Act, 53 years since Malcolm was killed, 50 years since Dr. King was murdered. 47 years, young people, since 18-year-olds got the right to vote. 18-year-olds have only had the right to vote in this country for 47 years. And all of those years prior, they could be sent to war, but they couldn't vote on those. Here we are. Here we are 10 years since Barack Obama was president of these United States. And though they called him everything under the sun, they still had to say, Mr. President. Thank you, Doctor. Here we are, 10 years, listen now, since secret documents unveiled by the courts reveal that the National Organization on Marriage stated in their own records that they were not really pushing against same-sex marriage for moral reasons. They merely wanted to create a split between the black community and the LGBT community in order to defeat President Obama. Here we are, five years since the Roberts Court, five to four, gutted the Voting Rights Act, Section 5. And five years since the Congress has had the opportunity to fix it, but Ryan, Boehner, McConnell have refused to fix the Voting Rights Act, Section 5, and pre-clearance. And here we are one year after the North Carolina NAACP and others fought the battle against the monster voter suppression law when people told us we couldn't win and we won and the courts, even the Roberts Court, had to agree that what they did was surgical racism. We, if we ever needed to vote, we need to vote because, number one, our place in history. Where we are. But if there's another reason if we ever needed to vote, 
We need to vote because we need a check on the presidency. You write this down. I want y'all to teach this outside of here. We need a check on the presidency. You see, in this democracy, there are supposed to be three branches of government. The legislative, the judicial, and the executive. And in some sense, each is supposed to be a check on the other to keep either one from operating in an autocratic manner. But in this current reality, that's not so much about Republican versus Democrat, but it's about extremism versus constitutionalism. It seems that the three have morphed into one. And this is dangerous no matter who the president is. You think about what we're seeing. For instance, in the Kavanaugh hearings, we saw the legislative and the executive morph. Hmm? And we see it in the nomination of jobs. I mean, before we knew the serious, credible allegations of Dr. Ford and others about sexual abuse and assault, before we even knew that, as horrendous as that is, and I know it because I personally had, as a child, had sexual assault committed against me twice, attempted sexual assault. And I don't even claim to know what it's like for a woman, even though I've had that experience. But before we knew about all of that, the president and the Senate leader morphed mm -hmm. together. That's not how it's supposed to work. Mm -hmm. The Senate leader held a nomination for 400 days over in a way that we have not seen since the Civil War. Would not even allow a hearing on anybody that Obama put up. Now, let me take a step and let you know that Part of the folk doing that, now I'm telling on them, I'm not telling you who to vote for, was Tillis and Burr. From right here in Winston Salem, Burr. And not only did they do that for Kavanaugh, Obama had nominated two black women for the Eastern District. One was a former Supreme Court Justice from North Carolina. The other was a high-ranking affiliate uh, lawyer in the Justice Department. And Burr, Tillis, and Grassley refused to even let those two black women have a hearing. Now understand, they, not, not that they let a hearing and voted against them, they wouldn't even have a hearing. And then when Trump became president, they pulled the two black women and put Thomas Farr in there. And Thomas Farr has been the lawyer that has been at the back of every major piece of voter suppression in this state for the last 20 years. And he helped manipulate the white supremacy campaign of Jesse Hams. And now they are trying to put Thomas Farr the, to be the federal judge in eastern North Carolina where most of the black folk live. And Thomas Farr was the lawyer we beat in court and the judge told them and him that what he was doing was surgical racism. And his reward, Derek, for losing is to replace Two black women that are more qualified for the office than he can even imagine. He's a lawyer. Patricia Timmons Goodman was a Supreme Court justice. And that happened before we got to Kavanaugh. Yep, 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 And most media didn't talk about it. Why was a senator from this state, Burr? Blocked two black women, no, three, because he also came out against Loretta Lynch. Now, as horrific as the allegation with Dr. Ford by were, the reality is, before we even knew about those allegations, there had been a, a, a political abuse of power or a raping of the system by the current leadership. Yeah. See, because rape is not really about sex, it's about power. 
That's why God in his word, Isaiah 10, now make sure you get this in the media, you quote this, Isaiah 10, chapter 1, verse 2. Woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children their prey. And pray there in Hebrew is considered to be a form of rape. Make sure that you say, the word said that. So when you hold up a nominee for hundred day, that's abuse of power. When you refuse to let all the paperwork come, that's abuse of power. And you know if Kavanaugh had been a woman or a Latino or a black person, they'd have pulled every paper they could have out. And then they changed the rules. It used to be 60 votes and now only 51. And they knew when Kavanaugh was nominated, Bishop Matt, that he had a record supporting voter suppression. It was Kavanaugh when the courts ruled that South Carolina's photo ID was unconstitutional. It was Kavanaugh who overturned that decision. Kavanaugh denied a woman's right to have an abortion who was in jail and a Latino. Kavanaugh supported torture. Kavanaugh is on the side of corporations and over 70% of his votes as, as a current federal judge was in favor of corporations over workers. This was known before Dr. Ford. And Kavanaugh, before we heard anything about this, Dr. Ford, he refused to even answer Senator Camilla Harris when she asked him, was Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act settled law? Now, now, Judge, listen to this. Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act says it prohibits any jurisdiction from implementing a voting qualification or prerequisite of voting or standard or practice or procedure in a manner which results in the denial or abridgment of right to vote on account of race, color, or language minority status. And Kavanaugh said, I can't answer that. Right, right, right. I can't. He'll be on the Supreme Court. And he doesn't believe that section two is settled law. Hmm? The first people that the White House wrote when Kavanaugh was elected were, were industry stakeholders. And they said, listen, we're getting ready to put a man on Supreme Court who has overruled federal regulators 75 times. In other words, he treats corporations like people and people like things. And then we found out about Dr. Ford and then they set up a kangaroo process they brought a prosecutor in to ask her question, but no redirect, no cross-examination. That, that's not a hearing. And then when it came to Kavanaugh, they stopped the prosecutor and the senators gave nine closing arguments. There's not a judge anywhere that's of any sort that would run anything like that, not even a hearing. No witnesses. Now you know, if this had been a black or brown man accused, allegedly, of rape and sexual abuse. But the point I'm making is that the legislative branch and the presidency have morphed. The Supreme Court has been political, politicized. And when that happens, we better vote for a check on the presidency because we're getting ready to elect every member of the United States Con representative and every member of the state legislature. And those, the, the Congress right now, the House of Representatives, is the only group, because we, we don't have a Senate election in North Carolina. We, we are electing a third of the senators around the world in this country. So since this is a national group, we better vote. Because when you don't have a check on a narcissist, And see, we keep talking about Trump, Trump, Trump. Trump couldn't do half of what he's doing without his enablers in the Congress. Now, another thing why we're gonna put a check on this president, because the president refuses to tone down rhetoric. Now somebody said, well, you're calling for the, 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 the select Democrat. No, I'm saying Republicans ought to put a check because they're not acting like Republicans right now. They're acting like extremists. They're not acting like Abraham Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt. My granddaddy was a Republican, so don't, tri don't trip with me. This is not Republicanism and Democrat. This is some form of extremism we're seeing. The president refuses to tone down the rhetoric and the substance. 
And he's using the kind of rhetoric we haven't seen since George Wilder. Now, I said that, and one reporter said, you, you can't call him George Wilder. I said, I didn't call him George Wilder. I said, we haven't seen that kind of rhetoric. Right, right. Right? right. When a high, when an when a official, a governor and up, literally says things that perpetrate, that, that, that promotes violence and vileness and hatred so openly and so blatantly. So they said, well, no, you can't say that. I said, okay, did you know that the day after the judge ruled that the Selma to Montgomery marchers could march, George Wallace was quoted as saying, the, the, the judge just made, him, made a kangaroo court out of the courts and he allowed a mob to take over Alabama. George Wallace called civil rights protesters mobs. Right. Donald Trump called civil rights protesters and nonviolent protesters mobs. Jesus. And when George Wallace was doing it, he started in February. By June, Mega Evers was dead. Yep. By November, four girls in a Birmingham church were dead. By, no, by, by September. By November, a president was dead. The next year, students were killed. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. The Bible says it's not what comes, goes in a man that defiles him, but what comes out. We need a check on the presidency. When the president refuses to even call people who are almost assassinated, and listen, do you understand what we just went through? I, I told some folks, I was talking about Bishop Mack. I said, I don't think some people get it, Mark um, Roland, what we just saw this week. I, I know I'm going to take a little time, but be patient with me. Because need, we need to hear this in the nation. This week, we saw attempted assassinations like, wait a minute, like we haven't seen since Abraham Lincoln was killed. You got to hear what I'm saying. I want y'all to understand how close we were to the precipice. How close we were to an undoing of this democracy. When Abraham Lincoln was shot in Fort Theater that night, they also tried to kill his cabinet. This week, before we get to yesterday, we saw the attempted assassination. And the only reason it didn't happen because the bomb didn't go off. Because right. the FBI said they were real. Right. Two presidents, yeah. two first ladies, a vice, former vice president, two former vice president, two, a former vice president, a CIA chief, two senators that may be candidates for president, both black, and we only had two blacks in the whole Senate. Both of them were targeted. Two entrepreneurs and philanthropists, a congresswoman, and we don't know how many people in mail rooms and CNN. I'm coming to the attorney general and CNN newsrooms, and an attorney general and his family. All those people could have been assassinated in one fell swoop. And when you have a president that says. We were doing all right winning, and then all this bomb stuff happened. Bomb stuff. Bombing. We haven't seen this kind of bombing attempt since the Civil Rights Movement. Right. And we haven't seen this kind of an attack on political uh, um, uh, people who are aligned since Abraham Lincoln, watch this, presided over the winning of the Civil War. And the people that hated him for that tried to take him and everybody around him out. That's right. That's right. That's right. And then we get to yesterday. Eleven people dead. And now reports are saying that both perpetrators, and we don't know if it's a conspiracy. We don't know how it's hooked up. We don't know if people are mentally ill. That's the, people run to that, they're mentally ill. Well, if that's the true, racism is a form of mental illness. I mean, if, if you just hate somebody because they're different, that's a form of mental illness. Homophobia is a form of mental illness. You just hate somebody because they're different than you. Huh? Xenophobia is a form of, of, of mental illness. If you're going to say mental illness, but 
both of the perpetrators that we know, things are coming out now that say they heard the conspiracy stories. They heard the lies. And they were some ways inspired life and death coming out of the tongue. And here's the thing, not a word of correction from the legislative branch. Think about that. The leadership of the legislative branch has not come together and said, Mr. President, shut your mouth. We need, instead what they're trying to say, oh, it is no different. He's just, he, he's just like that. Well, he may be like that, but America ought not be like that. We need a check on the presidency. And Dr. King told us when those four girls were blown up in the church and he went to do their, their, their funeral, Dr. King said, listen, because everybody was talking about who bombed them. And Dr. King said, we know who bombed them, but there's another question. He said, who? These girls have something to say that every politician who has fed his constituencies with the stale bread of hatred and the spoiled meat of racism, they have something to say to a federal government that has compromised with undemocratic practices of Southern Dixiecrats and blatant hypocrisy of right-wing Northern Republicans. They have something to say to every Negro who has passively accepted the evil system of segregation and has stood on the sidelines in a mighty, a mighty struggle for justice. They say to each of us black and white that we must substitute courage for caution and they say to us we must be concerned not merely about who murdered them but the system the way of life and the philosophy which produced the murderer we must be concerned not just about these two perpetrators but the words and the philosophy and the attitude from the highest level that produced them in the 21st century not only do we need to vote because of our place in history, vote because we need a check on the presidency, we need to vote because of the problems that politicians and state legislatures, the Congress, are not addressing. There are a lot of problems that folk aren't really addressing. And I'm speaking now to black politicians and white politicians. Huh? In fact, if you're a black politician and you don't are un unopposed, and you're not running like you are opposed, something wrong with you. You need to be pushing everybody out to vote, not just for you. If you, if you, I'm, amen, like, huh? And, and you can't just follow the talking points. There are 140 million poor people in America. 43.5% of the nation is poor and low wealth. When last time you heard a politician talk about the poor? Think about it. When did they come to your church and said, I'm, I, my job is to fight for the poor? There are 37 million people without health insurance. There are 62 million people who work every day without a living wage, 54% of all African Americans. There are 4 million families that get up every morning and can buy unleaded gas and can't buy unleaded water. Segregation is happening, resegregation of our public school is happening at a pace we haven't seen since 1970. And with the resegregation of the schools and the bodies goes the resegregation of the budgets and the books. There are thousands of poor people right here in Winston-Salem. There are 4.7 million poor people in North Carolina. 4.7 million poor and low wealth. There are one million people in North Carolina without health insurance, and our legislature would not approve the Affordable Care Act, which would have covered 500,000 uh, people without insurance. People like those down east that are being affected by the floods and the aftermath and the diseases. 346,000 of those people would have been white, 100 and some thousand would have been black, and 30,000 veterans. And how is it that we've come to a time when politicians can get free health care? Watch this. The state, if you're in the state legislature, you get a subsidy for health care. Am I right, Brother Paul? You get a subsidy. If you're the governor, you get free health care paid for by the people. 
If you are a House of Representatives, you get free health care paid by the people. If you're a senator, you get free health care paid for the people. How in the world can you get free health care from the people and then not want the people to have the same thing? That's hypocrisy. We're the only country in this world that doesn't offer some form of university, only of the 25 richest countries, excuse me, that doesn't offer some form of universal health care. All the southern states are poor. I didn't say poor intentionally. North Carolina, and yet all the southern states have the most politicians in Congress who vote against the program that would help the poor. Living wages, health care. And, and in the South, we have the most politicians in Congress and the Senate now who vote to cut taxes on the wealthy and then turn around and cut food stamps for the poor and cut heating services for the poor and refuse labor rights. 80% of North Carolinians want raising the minimum wage on the ballot and they will put six unconstitutional amendments on the ballot that we ought to vote against all six of them, but we'll not let black folk and white folk and brown folk and yellow folk and red folk vote to raise the minimum wage. Something is wrong. And we need to vote in a way that forces people to know we are here and there are issues that you have to deal with. Most poor people are white women and children and disabled. 39 million children are poor in America, 21 million elders, 26 million black people are poor and low wealth, 38 million Latinos, 66 million white people are poor. That's, that's almost 30 million more than black people, and yet when Republicans talk about the poverty, they blame the poor and say, and, and act as though poor is a black issue, and then when Democrats talk about the poor, they don't. They talk about middle class right, right. and working class. Right, right. Oh, y'all, you got to tell the truth. Right, right. And what we need is some leaders who will say there are 140 million poor people in this country and you cannot have a democracy when nearly 50% of your people are poor and low wealth. Here we are today, and we've seen 43% of adults in America with health insurance struggle to pay their deductible. And now, you know, th this health care is on the ballot because who you vote for is going to affect. And do you know that they are talking about um, ending the ability, the, 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 uh, re, re engaging the ability of insurance companies to deny you health care? based on pre-existing condition. Now, some of y'all might cuss, because then we're selling for cuss, because you're gonna get mad. But I don't want you to curse like vulgarity. I just want, if you have to do what Jesus did to that fig tree that had all them leaves, but no fruit. You know what Jesus, he condemned it. He said, you know, damn. But anyway, but, but, but anyway, but anyway, but, he did. Okay, so you might say that because we got a lot of politicians with a lot of fig tree leaves. So they're going around telling you now that they're going to protect uh, pre-existing. The same people are telling you that have voted 60 times in the House of Representatives to repeal the health care. 60 times, but all of a sudden they want to tell you they've had uh, some kind of revelation. An epiphany, right. now. They are saying they want to give more money to, well, they're not saying it, saying they want to cut uh, uh, this ability for us to get insurance even if we have a pre-existing condition. Now watch this. I learned this from a smart guy like Derek. See, I read all his stuff. Do you know that one of the pre-existing conditions is heartburn? Y'all better vote. What'd you say? They, they are saying that if you go to your doctor and complain of heartburn, acid reflux, they, that can be used to deny you health insurance. And every one of us know that you can get heartburn from Bojangles chicken, collard green, and ham hock. So we all gonna be out. Yeah.
It's funny, but it ain't funny. Huh? We going to school tonight. I want to make y'all mad enough not to stay up the rest of the night calling folks. You better, you better come on here and vote. Oh, they are saying, women, not sisters, if y'all, how many preachers we got here? Cause we might have to pray in a minute cause the sisters gonna get hot on this. I'm telling you they're going to, I'm, I'm not, I'm just reporting, I'm in school. They are trying to say in their list of things that are pre-existing, that if you ever been sexually abused. You heard that over there? You heard that? What? That's right. That if you've ever been sexually abused and you reported it, that can be cause for an insurance company to deny you. You stay home if you want to, now I'm telling you. They also are putting migraines up there. And you know you can give yourself a headache. I mean, just, you can worry yourself. I'm being facetious because I, I want to say other stuff, but, whew. And then there's another one I saw up there. If, 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 if your doctor, you happen to discuss with your doctor some of your sexual behavior and they think that's deviant. Maybe mad because they can't do it. And report you. <laughs> and they report you, they can use that to deny you. I'm, I'm trying to drop, and it's a whole other list. I'm talking about being able to deny you from insurance when you got cancer, and diabetes, and heart problems. All because there are some people that believe more in money than they do in mercy. And we're the only country of the 25 wealthiest that does not offer. My brothers and sisters, we need to vote because of the way in which not only policies are not being addressed, but the way in which our power is being threatened. Since 2013, with the Shelby decision, 23 states have adopted some form of voter suppression. Since 2010, 26 states. That represents 54% of all African American voters in those states. Over 50% 50 of the United States Senate, over 50, nearly over 50% of the United States House of Representatives. Since 2010, way before Trump, that's why we can't just vote by him. Way before Trump was on the ballot. The legislature, the House of Representatives and other places and state legislators were passing these voter suppression laws and then after Shelby, they went, wow. Yes, yes, sir. President uh, Derek Johnson is here fresh from a victory just a few days ago in Tennessee. I mean, they, they have gone voter suppression to the extreme. Yes, sir. In Georgia, the Secretary of State who's running for governor has blocked 53,000 from registering to vote. But, but that, but, and you hear that number and you say, oh my, well guess what? Since 2012, he has canceled 1.4 million. Before we ever heard about Trump, he canceled 1.4 million voter registrations. And he canceled 670,000 in 2017 alone. Gerrymandering, districts, state voter suppression. There are 16 states so I mean 16 or 17 seats in the United States House of Representatives according to the Brennan Center that if it wasn't for gerrymandered districts that stack and plaque back black, black um, um, districts. And by the way, black legislators have to let people, groups like the NAACP work out this, the gerrymandering and don't ever want to get in it to protect you. Because we don't need these seats where you got 70% black voters so you don't ever have to run again. And then you got, oh, you got all these other black voters that we could use to be a coalition between black and white people to elect candidates of our choice. Because in the, the legislature did that. They gave, they, they said, we're going to help you, we're going to do what in North Carolina. And they packed all these black voters in the black district, but the goal was to bleach and drain progressive votes out of other places 
so that they could not be a coalition. But there are about 16 seats to Brennan said, if it wasn't for gerrymandering, they wouldn't even be in the category they're in in terms of political party. And Donald Trump won by 77,000 votes. 77,000 votes. I said that in a place one time and three preachers cussed. I had to pray for them. <laughs> huh? Seven to seven thousand votes. He won by 30,000 votes in Wisconsin. Well, he didn't win, let me tell you. He was selected by the Electoral College because he lost by three million votes in the popular. And that's only happened three times, other times in history. George Bush and Rutherford B. Hayes in 1877. But 77,000 votes. Now in Wisconsin, he so-called won by 30,000 votes. But Ari Berman says there were 250,000 black votes suppressed in Wisconsin. And white too. He won by 10,000 votes in Michigan, but there were 100,000 black people in Detroit that, that were registered, didn't even vote. Oh, wait a minute, we're coming to North Carolina. We're coming to North Carolina because it's worse than Michigan. Trump won by less than 170,000 votes in North Carolina and 500,000 black folks stayed home that were already registered. And 2.6 million voters in North Carolina who were eligible to vote 2.1 million of them registered didn't vote. Now, that does not mean we didn't say, well, don't worry about the voter suppression, just vote, uh-uh. Voter suppression is wrong, and voter apathy is wrong too. So, we have this narcissist, God bless his heart, because of 77,000 votes. This man got a microphone to say all the vile stuff he said because of 77,000 votes. He, he's got the ability to sign a tax bill to cut $2.3 trillion from, from people and from programs that's gonna put Medicaid and Social Security in jeopardy because of 77,000 votes. He has the ability to sign a piece of legislation that took our military spending to over 60% we spend 60 cents of every discretionary dollar on war and only 15% of discretionary dollar on education on, and health care. The average CEO of military contractors earned $19.2 million a year when an average combat soldier on the front line earns less than $30,000 a year, all because of 77,000 right. votes. That's right. huh? his, 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 his secretary of education is cutting billions of dollars from education because of 77,000 votes. He's brought a group of clergy in and around him, you know, like Jeffers and Falwell, and they are teaching him that the only thing, moral things you ought to be concerned about, Mr. President, if you, as long as you're against abortion, against gay people, for prayer in the school, and for tax cuts and for guns, that's what God is really caring about. When the fact that the Bible is clear what God is caring about. Luke 4, the poor, the brokenhearted, the blind, those made to feel unacceptable. Matthew 25, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was a, when I was a, a stranger, when I was an undocumented immigrant, did you welcome me? When I was sick, did you care for me? But because of 77,000 votes, and two million people just in North Carolina, and over 107 million Americans that could have voted but stayed home. Stayed home. Stayed home. And because they stayed home, 77,000 votes. Well, my brothers and my sisters, we have early voting and nine days to election. And we have the opportunity right now to say never again. Across these nations, this nation, and not just this November, but the next time and the next time, and to build a movement, Aaron. Across this nation, I know this is tough times. 
the implosion of our economy, bombs going off, people being shot, people who want us to have pity on billionaires and more pain on the poor, politicians that pander to bigots and race baiting, and those, and, and those who have been forced to get on welfare and then they're forced off and all these work requirements that have nothing to do with really taking care of people and the gross sums of money that's being spent to take us backwards. It's lewd, it's pornographic, it's blatant, it's arrogant. These are troubling times. Corporations are being treated like people and people are being treated like things. We let banks get bailouts and we get turned out. The folk on Wall Street get helped up. The people on Back Street get pushed down. These are critical times. And if we ever needed to vote, we sure do need to vote now. I don't know if Republicans are going to go to the poll. I don't know if Democrats are going to go to the poll. But I know the sons and daughters of Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. We better go to the poll. And our white brothers and sisters that no justice better go to the poll. And our brown brothers and sisters better go to the poll. Everybody ought to be getting somebody. Every preacher ought to be using your social media. Every church and every lodge and every fraternity and every sorority ought to be using everything you have. Now in honor of my Jewish brothers and sisters, I was with some rabbis the other day, Bishop Wooden, and they told me, said, you're going on a preaching tour about voting. I said, yes. They said, let me help you. They said, in the Bible, in Hebrew, do you know the word for the, for the, for the word voice? I said, no. They said, well, the word for voice in the Bible is coil. It's coil, sound, audible sound. He's, and I said, well, okay, what does that mean? They said, the same word in Hebrew for vote is coil. K-O-L, Lord have mercy. I said, wait a minute, I need a little bit of help, Rabbi. I said, are you trying to tell me that in Job 37 and 2, when it says, listen carefully to the thunder of God's voice as it rolls from his mouth, that coil is thunder, voice, and that vote is coil too. I said, I got it now, I can preach now. I can tell folk it's time for us to make our voice and our votes sound like thunder. 107 million can't stay home. 50% of black folk can't stay home. We got to raise our voice and our voice like thunder. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's time to march to the polls and thunder until racism is ended. Thunder until everybody has health care. Thunder until we have a living wage. Thunder until immigrants are taken care of. It's time to put some control on Trump. It's time to thunder. Our parents did more with less. With less they beat the KKK. With less they won the right to vote. With less they got their labor rights. With less Harriet Tubman got slaves out of slavery. She didn't have email. She didn't have Facebook. She didn't have texting. She didn't have Twitter. She didn't have a car. But she had faith in God. She had a 38 pistol on her side. She had moss on the north side of the tree. She had a north star in the middle of the night. And she let her voice sound like thunder. So from now until November, email everybody you know, email everybody you know, text everybody you know, Facebook everybody you know, MySpace everybody you know, Instagram everybody you know, and tell them it's time to thunder, tell them it's time for us to show up to the polls, knock on every door, call everybody you know, get your children to go with you, canvas every block, if you don't know how to tweet, get with these young folk and let them tweet, 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 but if we ever needed to vote, we sure do need to vote now, and I'm a witness that if we do our part, God will show up. God will bless our efforts. He always has, and he always will. Faith is what you believe about God. Works is what you do because of what you believe about God. When you put faith and works together, it's like dynamite. When Moses stretched out his rod, God showed up. The wind came down, and the Red Sea opened up, and Pharaoh was brought down. When Shadrach, Meshach, and that bad Negro went to work, 
God showed up and the fire cooled down. When David threw his rock, the Goliath went down. And the next morning, the Jerusalem Journal read, the bigger they come, the harder they fall. When Daniel went in the lion's den, God showed up, made a pillar out of the lions. When Esther said, if I perish, I perish. God dealt with a narcissistic king that was full of himself and loved to grab women everywhere. God showed up. When God, when God will show up, when a woman with an issue of blood reached out and touched Jesus, God showed up. And on Friday, when God showed up and went to the cross, Satan's kingdom came down. And early Sunday morning, God got up when Thurgood Marshall went to the Supreme Court, God showed up. When Fannie Lou Hamer went to the Democratic Party, God showed up. When Rosa Parks sat down, God showed up. When Martin Luther King stood up, God showed up. I've got a question. Won't he show up? Won't he show up? Won't he show up? Tell your neighbor. Say, neighbor, it's time to thunder. It's time to raise your voice. It's time to show up. And do I have a witness? If we do what we're supposed to do, God will show up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we ever needed the book. Do me a favor, go hug three people and tell them if we ever need to vote, we sure do need to vote now. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand praise tonight. Now before you leave, how many of you got some cards? Don't you go anywhere. To fill out, to put five names of who you're going to hand them out. Don't go anywhere. We got work to do. Huh? Because if I have coiled KOL in here tonight and given direction, then we've got, in order to have thunder, you got to follow the directions. So we got cards coming out. We're all over. Do y'all have them in your hands? Hold them up. Like those? Everybody get one and fill it out before you leave and turn it in. Hallelujah. It looks like this. You put some name on it. We can send you an email. How many of you will get 10 people? Go call Timmy. How many of you gonna get on Facebook tonight? How many of you gonna get on? How many of you gonna campus show? Come in. Come on now. There's not enough to shout in church. Because let me tell you, grab somebody by the hand. We need an army to rise. Come on, choir, help me. There's an army rising. And I want to invite the president and CEO of the NAACP because he's been working on a strategy. You know, in order to get in the promised land, you got to shout when you go around Jericho, but you got to also have a strategy. Hallelujah. And I want everybody, is there an army rising in, in Winston-Salem? Is there an army rising in North Carolina? Is there an army rising that's going to thunder at the polls and thunder and build a movement? Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Come on, everybody. Come on, let's sing. There's an army. Yeah, did you already do it all? You already done it all? Okay, okay, I'm going to let you handle that. You hold those cards until offering time. Come on, Brother Derek. Come on, Roland. Let's, all of us, let's join hands. There's an army. There's an army. We want our white brothers and sisters, our black brothers and sisters, our Latino brothers and sisters, everybody, regardless of your race, your color, your sexuality, you believe in justice, it's time to thunder. You believe in people being helped and not hurt, it's time to thunder. But we need an army that can break every chain. Will you say it loud? That's right, across the aisle. Let the media see it. Let everybody see it. There's an army. All of you all over the nation, it's 
nine days, nine days. Nine days. If you got early voting, go. If you've already been, get somebody. If all you have is election day, go. Everybody say, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Oh, there's an army, there's an army. It's more of us that want justice than those that want injustice. We've just got to let our voice be heard. And we've got to do what we can do. Trust that God will do the rest. Hallelujah. You bring it down real easy. Now, will you all stay right there and hear the president and CEO of the NAACP, the largest civil rights organization in the world, more than 2,500, the drowned troops. This is our general, this is our Joshua in this moment. Please hear you, him. Good evening. Good evening. You know, take it to my friend, Dr. Bobby, to leave me this hot mic as if I was supposed to follow him. Let's give him a hand. You know, I just got off the plane from California after being in Memphis where we won a lawsuit Shelby County That's right. election commissioners That's was right. blocking close to 20,000 applications from being processed. I got there because I left from Louisville, Kentucky, right after the shooting, yeah. where the gunmen killed people in Kroger because the Baptist church doors were locked. Right. And 70 folks were in church for Bible study. I got on a plane going to Louisville from D.C. when I learned about the bombings, the bombs that were sent out. And it is an interesting dynamic where we have the President of the United States to determine he will continue to have rallies as opposed to look at our national security. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Elections have consequences. There are 88 legislative bodies across the country on the ballot. It is incumbent upon us to do what's happening in North Carolina. Amber just told me there were 175 election parties, 155,000 new registered voters, and we have nine days to get people to the polls. The power of five is a powerful thing. Anytime you have a preacher to stand in a Baptist church, and not ask people to come up with $20, but say, can you give me 20 votes? It tell you that our vote is our currency. And in this democracy, if we don't exercise that collective currency, we're going to get what we deserve. But I do believe with strategy and inspiration, we're going to get what we need because we're going to show up in North Carolina. We're going to show up in Georgia. And we're going to show up in Florida. And we're going to show up in all the areas we need to show up. Because we were built for a time like this to create the community that's beloved. And if it's not for us to do it, who else will? So thank you for all of your energy as we leave this place and feel good about the word that we heard. Let's do good with the works that we're going to do. Peace and power.